Trump? And how bad is his latest illness? Since we last spoke, Trump has re-re-defamed E. Jean Carroll and then re-re-re-defamed her yesterday live on national television. He has made some kind of financial deal to get the cash for the money he already owed her. He has vowed to cut Social Security and Medicare. He turned out to have praised Hitler more than we knew and other dictators. He has been endorsed by the dictator of Hungary, the one he once claimed was the dictator of Turkey, and maybe most importantly, his illness, his brain and or speech related disease has gotten so bad that among his now steady output of dozens and dozens of mispronunciations and nonsense words, he has even mispronounced the name of Vladimir Putin. Ukraine and Russia wouldn't be fighting. I knew Putin. I know him very well. I mean, Jesus Christ in a hat box. Whether you think Putin has video of Trump watching hmm toots, hmm on each other, or you just think Putin is blackmailing him conventionally, or you just think Trump admires Putin the way anybody who has admired Hitler for at least a half a century would, how does Trump mispronounce Putin's name? The answer is inescapable. Trump is ill. He's sick. He's getting sicker, and his illness is getting worse. And the only thing we know for certain about his illness is that it seems to get more profound later in the day and when he's tired, and that not only can a convincing argument be made, as I've outlined here before, for it being fluent aphasia, in which the victim can create the sounds and the flow of a sentence, but the words are increasingly wrong, but that it might instead or also be phonemic paraphasias. That is a disease usually associated with moderate or severe Alzheimer's in which the victim substitutes non-words for words that sound kind of like words. The psychologist and former Johns Hopkins Medical School professor, Dr. John Gartner, made that armchair informal diagnosis for the website Salon. We'll get to the social security cuts and the hourly defamation of E. Jean Carroll and the money story in a moment, but here are the lowlights of Trump's malaprops just since Saturday. In your mind, feel free to vote for which you think it is, fluent aphasia or phonemic paraphrase, yes. That's why they're weaponizing law enforcement for high-level election interference against Joe Biden's top and only political appointment, a guy named me. It's a guy named me. We have become a nation like nobody thought possible. By far the most disgraceful part of Joe Biden's service is the divisive, all compliments of an incompetent Biden administration. Megyn Kelly, may she rest in peace. They say that it's violent. Uh, the attacks, uh, Biden said it. I knew Putin, I know him very well. Again, I can't get over this. He mispronounced the name Putin. I would have sooner expected him to call Melania melanoma than to say potent, as in potent potables. The sound-alike Alzheimer's symptom advocate Dr. Gartner was one of the 27 psychiatrists and mental health experts who contributed to the 2017 best-selling book, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump. He now cites other sound-alike things Trump has said recently, quote, some examples of Trump's non-words, beneficiaries become beneficies. Renovations become renoverse. Pivotal became pivoball. Christmas became Chrysis. Bipartisan became bipars, unquote. And we can now add to that, potent became potent. Dr. Gartner adds, quote, this is a fundamental breakdown in the ability to use language. If you were talking to your father on the phone and he did this, you would think he is having a stroke. There is no healthy older person who speaks that way. Dr. Gartner also notes the word salads and the free association meanderings in his speeches and calls it, quote, a sign of real brain damage, not being old, not being slow, not losing a step, but of severe cognitive deterioration. What I don't understand is why those clips, he asks, aren't replayed over and over in the mainstream media. Isn't Trump babbling incoherently the most newsworthy part of his rally, unquote? Well, Dr. Gartner, I'm doing my damnedest. I knew Putin. I know him very well. Potent, as in potentate. 
the witch disease has he got stuff is not just idle reverse both sidesism either. It probably has extraordinary relevance to the seemingly unconnected news developments always swirling around Trump. I mean, what would better explain this E. Jean Carroll timeline? Friday, after a stay was denied, his lawyers posted bond of $91,600,000 for his first defamation of his sexual victim for claiming she had made up the story after a court found she had not made up the story and after another found he had defamed her again by saying she had made up the story. Saturday, at his fascist rally in Rome, Georgia, he then said, quote, I just posted a $91 million bond, $91 million on a fake story, totally made up story based on false accusations made about me by a woman that I knew nothing about, didn't know, never heard of. I know nothing about her. Monday, as E. Jean Carroll was arranging to discuss a new defamation suit against him for those, quote, Saturday, and as another deadline loomed for paying her another $83 million in damages for defamatory statements he made while president, he went on CNBC and called Carol, quote, Miss Bergdorf Goodman, a person I never met. I have no idea who she is. And nobody had even asked him about her or that case on CNBC. He just started talking about it. Needless to say, after that, E. Jean Carroll's lawyer, Robbie Kaplan, answered, quote, the statute of limitations for defamation in most jurisdictions is between one and three years. You can understand if Ms. Carroll and Mr. Kaplan are buried in paperwork over potential lawsuits against the bastard. How much of this could be explained by, could be exacerbated by fluent aphasia or phenomic paraphasiase or something else? or a cocktail of brain-related illnesses. And I haven't even mentioned Trump's continued insistence, continued belief that because he's been prosecuted in New York, companies are refusing to stay there and people are moving out of the city in droves when the only thing related to Trump that's happening here is they're taking his name off of all the buildings he doesn't own and the number of buildings he still owns may be dropping considerably in the immediate future. Which circles back to my first question, who owns him now? And that circles back to the 83 mil he had to pay E. Jean Carroll yesterday. The Trump bond for that amount was actually issued by Federal Insurance Company, part of the ever good for a laugh Chubb Group. Trump won't give any details about his Chubb bond. Chubb won't give any details. On the other hand, nobody gives anybody else 83 million for nothing. Is there a co-signer on this bond? Is Chubb, in effect, just washing money from somebody else to Trump? There is a Chubb insurance company in the United Arab Emirates. There is a Chubb Turkey and a Chubb Brazil. And oh, by the way, a Chubb insurance of Russia. Doesn't even have to be international to mean somebody now owns Trump. Last week, he met with the conservative hedge fund boss, Jeff Yass, and suddenly Trump did a full 180 on banning TikTok and now wants it continued, but Facebook banned because he just said Facebook is the enemy of the people. And oh, by the way, who owns $33 billion worth of TikTok? Oh, yeah, the guy just met with Jeff Yass. Trump also just confirmed yesterday that report that he had met with Elon Musk last week. Do Russians own Trump? Do Turks? Do Chubbs? Does Jeff Yass... Does Musk? I mean, why would Musk try to own Trump other than, you know, they're both racist fascists? Who owns Trump? All we know for sure is Trump lies about how much money he has, lies by a lot, maybe 90 percent. All we know is he needs money and he can't control himself. Money. He needs money. A lot of money. That's what he wants. That's what he. Wait a minute. That's what he... Oh, Nancy! My name is Trump and I'm sick in the bean. I can't stop plandering that E.G. Now give me money! That's what I want! That's what I want! That's what I want! That's what I want. Thank you, Nancy Faust. Belated happy birthday. Maybe that's what the Love Fest visit with Victor Orban was about. 
What we know about that that's new is Viktor Orban says Trump's peace plan in Ukraine is to not give that nation another penny to fight Putin. 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 Putin potentially Putin. What we know about Trump's continuing infatuation with dictators like Orban and mass murdering dictators of the past is reinforced by a new CNN piece in which John Kelly and John Bolton go on the record with stuff they have previously been quoted about third hand or anonymously. The Hitler did good things stuff and the Hitler's generals were loyal to him and you're not that he said to General Kelly. We knew Kelly followed that by explaining to Trump. No, no, the the generals kept trying to uh, assassinate Hitler. Now we know what Trump replied, according to Kelly. I didn't know that. The other new things John Kelly added, all the Hitler praise he alleges is now on the record. Trump spokespeople have repeatedly denied Trump ever praised Hitler, even though we learned as long ago as 1990 that in a lawsuit, Ivana mentioned hubby kept a book of Hitler's speeches in a bedside table. And Trump later told a reporter he got it from a fellow named Davis. General Kelly also has added a telling quote underscoring how little Trump knew about American democracy and how little he cares about it or for it. Quote, he was shocked that he didn't have dictatorial type powers to send U.S. forces places or to move money around within the budget. And he looked at Putin and Xi and that nutcase in North Korea as people who were like him in terms of being a tough guy. Only with Trump could a threat to cut Social Security and Medicare, echoing the one made by Rand Paul last week, get lost in the daily fire hose of the crazy. Ask about how we had to cut entitlements because of all that government debt, most of which Trump caused. Asked by Joe Kernan at CNBC, the guy with the bad rug. And Trump's answer was not only evidence of one of those diagnoses, but also it was stupid. There is a lot you can do in terms of entitlements, in terms of cutting, he said. He just said he wants to cut Medicare, Social Security. Quote, and in terms of also the theft and the bad management of entitlements, there's tremendous amounts of things and numbers of things you can do, unquote. And that circles back to the beginning because amounts of things and numbers of things are the same goddamn thing. There is a new January 6th nugget, by the way, and a new Trump stolen documents nugget. The latter first. Trump employee number five, come on down. You're the next contestant. He has identified himself. His name is Brian Butler, and he worked for Trump for 20 years, and he says Walt Nauda had him, Butler, load big white banker's boxes from Mar-a-Lago onto a private jet headed for Trump's golf course in New Jersey in June 2022. He said he recognized the boxes from the pictures in the indictment. He told the special prosecutor's office, which had kept his identity a secret until he revealed it on CNN. He also says, guess what? His boss is wrong, his ex-boss. It is not a witch hunt. The last remaining question, though, is why the Bedminster golf course was not sealed off the day Mr. Butler testified that there were boxes sent from Mar-a-Lago to New Jersey and why they didn't dig up that unseemly burial plot next to the first tee. All the documents are down here. The January 6th nugget, the Secret Service agent driving Trump's car after his go do a coup for me speech that day was interviewed by the January 6th committee. The agent's name was given, but was not released. He confirmed, so it's not anonymous, but he confirmed Trump demanded to be taken to the Capitol where his thugs were going to try to take the place over. The driver contradicts the assertion that Trump tried to take the wheel, which is all the Republicans are talking about. And it's why they released this stuff yesterday. He says Trump's voice was raised, but he didn't seem irate. He just wanted to go to the Capitol. And way more importantly, and all credit to Kyle Cheney of Politico for seeing this, the driver's testimony, including something far more damaging to Trump than the Republicans who released the transcript think it's damaging to Cassidy Hutchinson, included this. As Cheney noted, Congresswoman Jamie Herrera Butler of Washington confirmed that the then House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy... Remember Kevin McCarthy finally reached Trump by phone to urge him to call his gangs off at around 2.30 on January 6th. 
Trump, quoting her, quoting McCarthy, quoting Trump, initially repeated the falsehood that it was Antifa that had breached the Capitol. But in the committee's interview with the driver, the driver insists that an hour or an hour and a quarter earlier, Trump insisted to him that he faced no danger no matter what happened at the Capitol. Quoting the driver, the thing that sticks out most was he kept asking why we couldn't go, why we couldn't go, and that there wasn't any reason to be concerned about the people that were there or reference them being Trump people or Trump supporters. Wasn't concerned about the people that were there. Trump ended his speech at 110 on January 6th. Trump's motorcade left the ellipse at 117, got back to the White House at 119. McCarthy was already on TV recounting that phone call with the Antifa reference at 3.05 p.m. In short, at 115 or 116 or 117, Trump admitted to two Secret Service agents that those storming the Capitol posed no danger to him because they were Trump people. The Capitol Police would retreat at 1.30. At 2.30 or so, Trump tried to convince McCarthy that his terrorists were actually Antifa. A good prosecutor could make that into guilty foreknowledge and obstruction of justice. A bad prosecutor could be named Robert K. Herr, the Trump stooge whose testimony today to the House Judiciary Committee run by the Trump stooge Jim Jordan has taken on an entirely different vibe than it had as late as 9 p.m. last Thursday. Then, her expected to be hailed by Republicans, congratulating him on valiantly noting that while he would not file any charges, not one, not even some benign technical violation of the law, nothing, that while he didn't do any of that, he had been able to warn the American people that, as he wrote, President Biden could present himself as a, quote, sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. Still remembers what? Putin's name is. Then came Biden's extraordinary State of the Union performance Thursday night and the death, except within the Republican bubble, and even in part of the Republican bubble, of the entire MAGA Biden age plot. Now, don't be surprised if the following happens. Republicans will still try to reignite the age plot if it does not catch fire immediately, if Swalwell or Schiff or Ted Lieu or Neguse or Steve Cohen instead light Robert Herr on fire, watch the Republicans spent the rest of this hearing excoriating Robert Herr for refusing to bring charges against the president and asking him to reveal whether Merrick Garland railroaded him or if Herr has simply sold out to the Democrats. By the way, if you want a tiny lull related to bad special counsels, remember the Biden impeachment? Remember the Hunter Biden special counsel? David Weiss? The previous two fascist conspiracy theories that turned out to be DOA? The Republicans' key witness in both Alexander Smirnoff, the one who is in jail until his trial starts because he lied to the FBI about Hunter Biden and Joe Biden. Well, it turns out that in a court case eight years ago, Smirnoff gave the street address in San Francisco for what he claimed was his home. In fact, that address turns out to be the address in the official records for a median on a San Francisco roadway. I totally don't got my address. I falsified my renewal. Put down 1060 West Addison. 1060 West Addison? We're on a mission from God. Also of interest here, did Marjorie Taylor Greene set up President Biden to get Lakin Riley's name wrong in the State of the Union? Or did she simply try to question his functionality after making the same mistake she did when she called the woman by the wrong name? And did you know that Saturday was Kim Guilfoyle's birthday? They had a giant cake with red roses on it, made out of icing. To paraphrase the great Alan Zweibel's joke on Saturday Night Live, the cake was free, but if you wanted to lick it, it was 20 bucks. That's next. This is Countdown. 
This is Countdown with Keith Olbermann. Postscripts to the news. Some headlines, some updates, some snark, some predictions. Dateline, Kensington Palace in London. Hello. Kate, Princess of Wales, has apologized for that photo. That photo of her and her kids for UK Mother's Day that all the news agencies around the world issued a mandatory kill about because it turned out somebody had doctored the photo and there were disappearing cuffs and blurry hands. And she now says, quote, like many amateur photographers, I do occasionally experiment with editing. I wanted to express my apologies for any confusion the family photograph we shared Sunday caused. Sure. Actually, she was photographed herself yesterday in a car with Prince, uh, Prince what's his name, the one they didn't fire, only she was facing away from the camera, so we still don't know if she's recovered from her not-revealed illness or what. And by the way, I'm hearing that the real problem with the photo, the real reason she photoshopped it in the first place was there was a fifth figure in the back besides her and the three kids who's not supposed to be photographed. John F. Kennedy Jr. Uh Uh-huh. Dateline the Vatican. Oh, for crying out loud, now they're going to have to get an entirely new pope again. Pope Francis telling interviewers that Ukraine should have, quote, the courage of the white flag and negotiate a settlement with Ukraine. Is his real name Pope Elon? At least he's holding up the tradition of the Catholic Church, which before and during the Second World War did nothing to help Spain, then the Jews in Germany, then Europe, and basically sided with Hitler straight through under Pope Pius VI and Pope Pius VII, though they said many mean things about the Nazis. Maybe Pope Francis, he should have the, quote, courage of the go F yourself. And Dateline, a cave in Georgia. You may have heard that after slamming President Biden for mistakenly calling the murdered woman Lincoln Riley, Lincoln Riley, during the State of the Union, Marjorie Taylor Cave Woman Green made exactly the same mistake from a Trump rally, no less, on television. But it's way worse than that, actually. It sure looks and sounds as if Green had deliberately set the president up to call the poor woman Lincoln Riley and confessed it, inadvertently perhaps. Her exact comment to the interviewer, she told the guy that she had told President Biden Thursday night as she harangued him at the State of the Union, quote, say her name, Lincoln Riley. And he had this pen in his hand. I had given it to him as he walked down the aisle. And when I yelled out at him and I said, say her name, Lincoln Riley, he picked up the pen and he had it right there. It's easy to read. Lincoln. Two words for Marjorie Taylor Greene, scum bag. Still ahead of us on this edition of Countdown, so somebody big in TV who's not in news asked me after that State of the Union show Thursday night why I was not back on MSNBC, and I had to explain Matto sank the deal, and I had to explain the whole story, including the $437 out of my own pocket with which I hired her in the first place, and I told him, if I can tell him, I can tell you. Next in things I promised not to tell, I lied. First, a good time to thank you for joining us on that State of the Union post-game show live on YouTube and Twitch, and then on there on video, and then up as the Friday podcast. The latest audience total for all the venues is like 165,000, which is more viewers and listeners, a larger audience than all but eight television news operations after the State of the Union. I mean, this was consumed by more people after the State of the Union, then we're watching PBS, CNBC, Univision, Telemundo, CNNE, and frankly, I've never heard of CNNE before, so this makes sense, News Nation, Newsmax, and Flowmax. Thank you. 
Now still more idiots to talk about. The daily roundup of the miscreants, morons, and Dunning-Kruger effect specimens who constitute today's worst persons in the world. The bronze, politico, worse. It's not just them, obviously, but they took it to a new level. What's it? Screwing up the really screwed up Katie Britt story. Politico first missed the fact that she was trying to blame President Biden for a sexual abuse case that not only took place in Mexico, but took place during the administration of George W. Bush. It wasn't just Politico. As I said, so did the New York Times. They missed this. Washington Post, CNN, NBC News, ABC, CBS, Associated Press, Axios, Flomax. I mean, they all really screwed up. The story was broken by the independent journalist Jonathan Katz, formerly of the AP, who produced a video showing how he broke the story by simply thinking about it for a minute and then Googling it. But Politico has now credited the story to, well, let me just read what they wrote. Under heavy scrutiny from the press, the story in Brit's speech that tied a girl's sex trafficking to border failures under Biden earned a whopping four Pinocchios from the Washington Post's Glenn Kessler. The fact checker found that her account, unquote, etc. Not only did Glenn Kessler not find a damn thing that hadn't been first found by Mr. Katz in a TikTok video, but in Kessler's account, he never even mentions that Katz beat him to the story by two whole days. And Politico implies the Post, or at least the press, dug out the lies of the unfortunate bad actress Katie Britt. This is a good moment to note as well that while the New York Times did an excellent job revealing that George Santos was not who he seemed to be, that revelation happened months after he had already been elected in the area that is supposedly where the Times is based. That's why they call it the New York Times. It's not a nickname. It's actually theoretically produced for people in New York. The Times, the national news organizations, the New York newspapers all failed to vet George Santos before that election. Not even the cursory kind of Googling that would lead to something like what Jonathan Katz discovered. It takes about 30 seconds. I do it on at least a quarter of everything I put into this podcast just on the simple theory that who knows, maybe there's something else about this guy. I mean, my God, at least look at Wikipedia. But nobody looked anywhere at George Santos. Nobody looked anywhere at Katie Britt and at God knows what else. The major news organizations only seem interested in what is already being covered by the other major news organizations. Yes, their business formula has been getting less and less plausible every year, but left out of that equation is the terrifying reality that their effort level and originality and willingness to take a minute and Google the effing thing sucks. Our runner-up, Mitt Romney, who is going out with a whimper, not a bang, Mitt has an extraordinary capacity for doing and writing and saying dumb things. He once harangued me for calling Trump a terrorist. Three months later, he found himself under attack in the Capitol on January 6th by terrorists sent by Trump. Surprise! But on the subject of Katie Britt, Mitt has topped himself. Quote, in a good way, the delivery was over the top, out of character. Biden's, of course. Katie Britt's, too. The media overreaction to hers, not his, tells us who liberals most fear as VP nominee. Mitt, uh, firstly... The just this right side of anger the president showed in the State of the Union, that used to be what he was known for. He yelled, he raged, he spoke really loudly. You know, during his his first 30 years in the Senate. While you, Mitt, you were working for hedge fund companies. But as to who liberals most fear as VP nominee, I'm not much on hunch political forecasting, but my God, Mitt, if you let liberals vote as to who we'd most like to see the Republican vice presidential candidate be, the option that would most help Biden get reelected, I'm thinking Katie Britt would get 90% of our votes now. Yes, anybody and Britt, anybody and Britt. But our winner topping even the entirety of the mainstream media and Mitt Romney, Bill Maher. I'm not going to rehash the 46 years since I met him and the two times I missed the chance to sock him and get away with it. But I will say that I was kind of flummoxed as to what had happened to him, how Maher had gradually turned from a generally consistent liberal with occasional complete blackouts like his ongoing relationship with Ann Coltergeist 
how he had turned from that to a lazy, uninformed libertarian who will both sides anything for a laugh. Well, for a possible laugh, he really hasn't been funny in seven or eight years. He continued to insist that Biden should drop out until the State of the Union. Sudden 180, just like that putz as recline. Well, now we know why. What has happened to Bill Maher? Bill Maher did a podcast with Mediaite. That's a bad sign to begin with. Mediaite is crap. And it continues also to be the dumbest name in news or news adjacent. Mediaite? <sighs> But he explained his news diet, Marr did, in this podcast. He says his staff sends him a digest of stuff from the big news organizations, but, quote, I also love my independent writers. Just read Andrew Sullivan. Oh, good. Andrew Sullivan, who was last right about something in 2002. Quoting again, my friends Barry Weiss and Nellie Bowles. Barry Weiss? Because Jonathan Turley doesn't write enough about politics? Quote, Andrew Sullivan, George Will, a bunch of people like that. George Will? George Will is who you read about when nobody else is writing that day. And I mean only read about baseball from George Will. Quote, I still love my Maureen Dowd. I love my Tom Friedman and Brett Stevens. Pamela Paul I've come to like a lot. Oh, sweet Jesus in a hat box. Bill Maher is this close to voting for Jill Stein. Maureen Dowd? Brett Stevens, Andrew Sullivan, Pamela Paul. It's not just that Bill Maher has forfeited whatever liberal credentials he once had. He's turned into, into Howard Kurtz. Bill, next thing you'll be telling me, your go-to TV liberal is Joe Scarborough Maher. Today's worst person in the world. Late in November 2007, after several months of pressuring my MSNBC bosses to hire Rachel Maddow to try out as my guest host with a goal of then showcasing her and spinning her off into her own show, the vice president in charge of the network, Phil Griffin, agreed to give Maddow a deal for 40 or 50 grand as an MSNBC contributor. It would do nothing more than lock her in place so that CNN would not steal her from us. I mean, I knew that that conversation and that concession still would not get her her own show. But what I did not know was the concession I was told about, the contributor's contract, it was a lie. And by January of 2008, as the Clinton-Obama primary race turned into a tongue war, we were imposing upon Rachel Maddow to join the desk each Tuesday for primary night. She was not anchoring, she was not even the lead analyst, and my uncontrollable fire hose co-host Matthews was consistently pretending that she did not actually exist. But she existed, she was there, and I quizzed her about every topic, every chance I got. Soon I began to include her appearances in the pre-recorded open that I would write, two minutes of hyperbole that was really designed merely to give everybody enough time to get my fat ass into the anchor chair and everybody else's mics on. With Tim Russert in the NBC News Washington Bureau, David Gregory at Clinton headquarters, Howard Feynman and Eugene Robinson in New York, Chuck Todd at the exit poll desk, Tom Brokaw at the perspective desk, M.C. Escher at the lack of perspective desk. Then came Super Tuesday, February 5th, 2008. I was writing this orgasmic drivel, as I always did on Tuesday, crossing the names of who was where off the list as I went, the list handed to me by the executive producer Izzy Povich, when I noticed the list did not include either Rachel or the Rachel desk. I knocked on the wall that separated our little offices at 30 Rock, and she shuffled in, complete with a sincere smile of friendship, but always also with what seemed to be a little space kept in reserve where she could wonder if I was mad enough to try to take somebody hostage. Yes, my third child? Where's Rachel tonight? I asked as I waved the paper at her, assuming oversight, but leaving my own little space in reserve where my earlier nightmare had come true. Not on paper. Please to put name Rachel on paper. Izzy Povich said it matter-of-factly. Oh, yeah, well... Oh, I was in trouble. 
That elongated consonant always meant trouble. She's on Larry King tonight. Momentarily, I went very stupid. Well, how in the hell does that work when she has a contract with us? I'll tell you, but you have to promise not to hate me. The Izzy Povich fake cringe and crouch ensued. Phil made me promise not to tell you. Rachel doesn't have a contract with us. He told me he told you he'd get her one. Then his boss refused to give him the money. I'm sorry, you promised not to hate me. Momentarily, I was calm. Momentarily. But uh, why, why didn't you tell me that before approximately, oh, right now? Why didn't you tell me this before she agreed to go on Larry King's show? Well, she only decided this morning. Apparently, she really needs the cash. I told Phil, and he said, those are the breaks, buddy. The last thing I actually remember doing, the last part that I did not need to recreate from the memories of others and an occasional flashback in therapy, was asking how much my old friend Larry King was going to give Rachel. Izzy pursed her lips. $250. I remember screaming that figure several times along with all the swear words I knew. I remember vocalizing. We are going to lose Rachel Maddow, the next great talent of cable news, to effing CNN for 250 effing dollars. Everything else after that statement is darkness. I know I phoned Phil Griffin and threatened him. Izzy recently confirmed for me that I asked her to leave before I called him and threatened him. I believe I warned him that if he did not sign her to a contributor's contract within 24 hours, I would walk off the set during that night's primary coverage or maybe the next week's or maybe during countdown tomorrow night. It would be a surprise. I'm also confident that I warned him that of all the talent on television, Larry King had the best knowledge of what and who else would succeed. More than the rest of us combined, he was a savant. And when he saw her in real time on his primary night panel, we would never see her again. And she would have a CNN contract before midnight. I told Phil that when that happened, I would then kill him with my bare hands. Or Jeff Zucker would kill him when she wound up beating the hell out of us in the ratings. This statement all took longer than this paragraph would imply because I know without fear of contradiction, every other word out of my mouth was either what we used to call an oath or the phrase, Jesus H. Christ. Mind you, these people, the president of NBC, Jeff Zucker, and it's a year since they got rid of him at CNN, the president of NBC News, Steve Kappas, and the soon-to-be president of MSNBC, Phil Griffin, these had been the same people who about a year earlier had decided that their 10 p.m. host, Tucker Carlson, yep, Tucker Carlson was on MSNBC, that Tucker Carlson did not need two people to play the role of liberal foil on his show at like 50 grand a year. So they kept one of them. His name was Max Kellerman, and they fired the other one. Her name was Rachel Maddow. They fired Rachel Maddow at MSNBC to save $50,000. She was back now at MSNBC only because my producer, Izzy, had suggested making her a regular guest. And within a couple of months, I realized she would be the next great host in cable news. And after months of pleading, including pleading with her because she didn't want to do it, I had just convinced them to put her back under contract, except they had lied to me and they had not put her back under contract. I may have mentioned this to Phil Griffin during our phone call. 111 different times I may have mentioned it to him. I also telephoned Rachel. I did not swear at her. Here, every other word out of my mouth was not an oath, but an apology. I said I had genuinely believed she was already being paid, and I was not only humiliated on behalf of my network, but that I was far more humiliated that I had not double-checked with her that they'd actually given her the contract they told me they had given her. I begged her to please, please, please don't go on CNN tonight. I did not ask her to skip out on them and return to us unless she thought she could pull that off gracefully and with a clean conscience, but just not to go on with Larry. And that's where I added the little $437 stunt. I'm sorry about the money situation, I said. I didn't know. Now I know. I can only do this. 
I think they will give you forty or fifty thousand for a contributors deal just to start. But what I will do is, and while making as many sound effects of exertion as I could dream up, I stretched around, I pulled my wallet out of my back pocket, and I emptied it onto my desk. I need to keep five bucks to tip my driver tonight. You can have the rest of whatever cash I have on me. I'm counting it now. There's a hundred. Twenty, twenty, twenty. My play-by-play skipped no bills. Four hundred and forty-two bucks. American. Five for the driver, the rest for you. Four hundred and thirty-seven dollars, Rachel. Deal? She laughed. I'll see you tonight. I'll just tell Larry I couldn't be disloyal to you. Oh, and I will take the money. And she took the money. In point of fact, when I like to say anything that Rachel Maddow did with her career after we got her show on the air in August of 2008, that's all her doing. I have nothing to do with that except being the lead in for the first two years. That's true. But I also like to say that I got that show on the air. And I also like to say I hired Rachel Maddow at MSNBC, and this is my point. It was not figuratively, it was not metaphorically, I hired her out of my own pocket. I literally hired Maddow at MSNBC for $437. And I will point this out again. I never even got the $437 back. all the damage I can do here, including to my voice, I think, when I was singing. Thanks for listening. Counting out musical directors Brian Ray and John Philip Chanel arranged, produced, and performed most of our music, but they would like to remind you they had nothing to do with my singing. Mr. Ray was on guitars, bass, and drums. Mr. Chanel handled orchestration and keyboards, produced by TKO Brothers, except for the song. Other music, including some of the Beethoven compositions, arranged and performed by the group No Horns Allowed. The sports music is the Olbermann theme from ESPN2, written by Mitch Warren Davis, courtesy of ESPN Inc. Our satirical and pithy musical comments are by Nancy Faust, the best baseball stadium organist ever. Our announcer today was my friend Larry David. Everything else was pretty much my fault, especially the singing. That's Countdown for this 239th day before the 2024 presidential election and the 1,162nd day since Dementia J. Trump's first attempted coup against the democratically elected government of the United States. Use the 14th Amendment and the not regularly given elector objection option, the Insurrection Act, the justice system, the mental health system, and my singing to stop him from doing it again while we still can. The next scheduled countdown is tomorrow, bulletins as the news warrants. Till then, I'm Keith Olbermann. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, and good luck. Take two. Little louder, please. My name is Trump and I'm sick in the bean. I can't stop slandering that E.G. That came in money. That's what I want. That's what I want. That's what I want. That's what I want. That's what I want.